All right, we have another interview episode with James I. Bond. And James, well, we'll get to your background and all that in a minute, but what the heck is Brain Glue? You have the book there behind you. What the heck is Brain Glue and why will this make us more money as marketers? So Brain Glue makes your ideas sticky. So they stick to your prospect's brain like glue, making it much, and doing that makes it much easier to get people to say yes to your ideas and buy your products. So yeah, it's just, and it's, it works like a miracle. And all, when I basically, I didn't invent brain glue, I invented the term brain glue. What I did was I started researching all the different ways that right brain selling or emotional selling works. And I've been doing it for 35 years. So I'm like really old, let me start there. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you some background on that. But anyway, but the point is I started recognizing there are these patterns and when, if you follow the pattern, you can suddenly sell like crazy. And I've got, you know, besides the fact that I researched these things, and that's how I came up with this, I started applying it to clients, and their ex, their sales like just skyrocketed. And by the way, copywriters, I love, love, love copywriters. So if you guys have to write your own copy and you don't know Brangle, you guys are crazy because it's, you know, you, you know, you don't have to totally read the book. I hope you buy the book, but even if you don't, just go to Amazon. And look at some of the chapters and it, it show, you know, gives you access to it. And you'll start to recognize, wait a second. Oh, this is really, I see how this all fits together. Yes, I can't wait to dive in further because I, I, I went through the audiobook for the first time, the first of what will be multiple times. And um, everything that he's saying is absolutely true. There are going to be some things that if you are an experienced copywriter, you recognize like, oh, yeah, I know that. And there's going to be lots of other things that are taking your thinking in new directions, especially related to any kind of messaging you're trying to do right now. So James I. Bond, and if you're going to Google him, add the I because it makes him easier to find. James I. Bond is one of America's leading behavioral management specialists and author of the award-winning book, Brain Glue, How Selling Becomes Much Easier by Making Your Ideas Sticky. For 13 years, he ran one of Southern California's leading behavioral management firms, working with a who's who of American business. Early in his career, he ran an advertising agency in Montreal. He is a past workshop chairman and current workshop presenter for the resource partner of the U.S. Small Business Administration, has been a guest speaker at two California universities. James, welcome. Thank you for being on Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Um, Thank you, I, I, just, I love your podcast. Your podcast. I love... <laughs> You get right to it. You know, it's like, it isn't like there's this whole setup and everything else. And you're, you know, it's like you get right to it, which is great. I, I love that. Yeah, I want to get people engaged out of the gate. Uh, I went through your book on Brain Glue, titled Brain Glue. And for me, I, one of the things I was, I was partway through it. And it just jumped out at me like, this is a creative inspiration tool. And I was telling you this before we hit record, that I could go through this on a new project or with a new client or, you know, just trying to come up with new messaging. And every time through, because I'd be thinking about it through that lens of that new project, it would just spark new good ideas there. So can we just start with a quick overview of what readers find in the book Brain Glue? Like it's structured as a series of chapters that have different ways that you can make your ideas sticky. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, there are 14 ways. Okay. Uh, and I actually found a, another one, so I'll talk about a little bit about that too. Okay, it's uh, okay. asymmetry, which is really powerful. But um, there are fourteen. Uh, the brain loves patterns. Yes, so there are certain patterns. That's why we love rhyme. I remember. I'm old enough to remember, and hopefully a lot of your people uh, know this also. Is Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Fetch a pail of water. Okay, Jack fell yeah. down. And... Exactly. Yep. Good. <laughs> when was the last time you heard that? For me, it was over 60 years ago, you know, and yet I remember it like it was yesterday because it sticks to the brain. And it doesn't just stick because it repeated, it sticks because it's rhyme. You know, so you take somebody like uh, uh, Johnny Cochran, who was defending O.J. Simpson. He said, you know, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> you know, it's like what? And when yeah. they, they let him go, even though they had all this evidence against them because of the glove thing. And so it's but it sticks to the brain. And so we recognize um you know, um, a lot of uh, advertisers use use the rhyme because they recognize that it's powerful enough that it's, it sticks to the brain and it actually helps. You know, we we are so bombarded with information, with knowledge. You know, people are walking around yeah. the, the streets now with their phones. <laughs> They're still getting information, even if it's from friends. Okay. Yeah. So 
we're bombarded with information. And so because we're so bombarded with information, you can talk to somebody. Like I talked to my wife, okay? And she goes, but I say, hey, da, 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 I'm telling her this thing. And then she, I say, you weren't really listening to me, were you? She said, no, yeah, I was. I said, okay, what was I saying? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we're a lot like that because we're so overwhelmed with information that we half listen. It looks like we're listening, but we're half listening. And so when you use a tool that gets the stick to the brain, they go like, oh, okay, wait a second. I mean, I'm old enough to remember. I'm not old enough to remember. I'm old. <laughs> but I mean, I know that we used to do head and shoulders, knees and toes, eyes, ears, mouth and nose. I was actually trying yes. to coordinate my hands. I couldn't, okay? But as kids, <laughs> we could, okay? So if you're coming up with a dandruff shampoo, you already know that head and shoulders, knees and toes, eyes, ears, mouth and nose is already embedded in people's brains. So why yes. don't we call it head and shoulders, okay? And like, it will trigger, okay? So the first thing we want to recognize is there's something called redintegration, which is the brain's need for completion. If I tell you a joke, Jokes will often take a, a, um, um, something that's already embedded in the brain and twist it at the end, okay? It's like, fool me once, shame yes. on you. Fool me twice. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Congratulations. You know, <laughs> people go like, wait a second. Okay. Uh -huh, that was funny. And so when you yeah. understand the patterns, two things happen. First is you can use the patterns. Second one is you can use asymmetry, which is the opposite of the pattern. You know, so like they're preparing them for the pattern and then you, you take them on a left turn right at the end. And so it's it's really, it's it's so powerful. You know, I went like, wow, at first I was researching this and I've been doing it for 35 years. So I've been, I got this, I call it a passion box. I've been filling the passion box. My wife hates going with me to doctor's offices because we go to a doctor's office, I'm reading a magazine. I go, oh, look at this great ad. And she goes, do not tear it out of the magazine. I said, no, no I have to put it in my passion box. And she goes, she just sit as far away from me as possible. I do not know that guy, okay? But, you know, but I would put things in it. Eventually, I started putting not just ads in my passion box, but I started putting comments in my, you know, I grew up with uh, JFK, uh, John F. Kennedy. And so he yeah. said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. So I was like, wow, that's powerful. I wrote that down because I knew there was a pattern, but I didn't know what the pattern was. Today, I know it's called chiasmus, you know, so. But as I started learning these patterns, I went like, whoa, you know, uh, using chiasmus. Uh, he said, uh, mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. So I love Malcolm X. Malcolm X said, you know, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock landed on us. It's like, OK, now think of how much more powerful it is saying that than saying, hey, come on, guys, you have no idea what we've gone through as blacks in America. OK, I mean, yeah. that's OK. I've heard it. It goes in one or the other. But by saying, hey, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock landed on us. So it triggers different parts of the brain. And you start going like, whoa. Yeah, he also said, um, when you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. Yeah. Think how and that, that's that's actually that's actually picked back up in Hamilton. Um, if you stand for nothing, Burr, what do you fall for? Um, it's it's Sorry. a great lyric that like really hits in the show. I have to tell you something about Ryan. So we're gonna we're gonna dig more into a lot of this stuff over mm -hmm. the course of this conversation. I have to tell you something about rhyming. And I was trying to remember the name of the book. It was a it was a book of Dr. Seuss short stories that have been published elsewhere, but then kind of lost. And I'm not remembering it. But prior to that, uh, like at the beginning of the, the book, um, it is there's a there's an essay from Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss. Uh -huh. And he's talking about why he changed because his earliest writing was not rhyming. And then one day he hmm. saw this like four year old who couldn't read yet reciting a rhyme that he like he tried one rhyming book and he saw this four-year-old like reading the book reciting the rhyme but the like it could the, the the kid couldn't read right and he said wow rhyming is incredibly powerful and to your point at sticking in the brain right and uh and from that moment forward he he became one of the best rhyming children's book authors ever, if not the best. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, let me give you an example of rhyme and how powerful rhyme okay. is, okay? Yes. You know the song, I've been standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona, such a fine sight to see. It's a girl, my lord, in a flatbed Ford, slowing down to take a look at me, okay? Eagle. Yes. Fabulous song. One of the song that actually started their fame fame, okay? 
they didn't intend to do this, but they turned Winslow, Arizona into a tourist attraction. It's, I had this lady who I was talking to, and she says, I'm in Arizona. Have you ever been to Winslow? It's a hole in the wall. So sorry, you know. But they have a statue of a guy, with a lamppost with a guy leaning against it, and it embedded in the, in the metal, whatever it is in the lamppost, it says, standing on the corner. And then she's telling me, yeah, and they put a car now, a flatbed Ford with a girl in it right over there. So people, you know, they're driving on Route 66, and they see Winslow, Arizona. Oh, wow, we got to check that. Check that out. They'll pull over and they'll take pictures of themselves in front of the statue, you know? But it's just, oh, that's they weren't intending to sell Winslow, but rhyme works so powerfully that it sells stuff even if you don't realize you're, you're selling stuff. Yeah. Um, by the way, side note, the name of the book is The Bipolo Seed and Other Lost Stories by Dr. Okay. Seuss. Awesome. Um, if you wanted to check it out. the Okay. Um, so so I've, got, rhyme um, I've got a great... Um, I love comedians use angular tools all the time. So uh, I got this one. I was just reading it and I loved it. It's better to wake up and pee than to pee and wake up. Okay. Uh, Absolutely. So how about this one? Here's a, here's um an ad for Pampers diapers um, to pee or not to pee. We have the answer. <laughs> okay. And it makes you laugh. So this guy, uh, um, Paul Tran, and he's got, because uh, analogy and metaphor, which is metaphor from Mars, metaphor from Venus. I mean, there are a bunch of things that are really powerful. I'll talk about that. But uh, Paul Tran has an electric razor that shaves man's private areas. Okay. And so he wanted to come up with a name that would not be offensive, but would still be descriptive of his product. And that's yes. one of the things I want, you know, you guys, everybody who's listening and, and you for sure, Roy, Go to your out of the box and think of something that's the craziest um, a metaphor analogy you could think of. It's just like, uh, you know, what his is just like <laughs> a lawnmower. Was, so he and so he named the product the lawnmower, and sales <laughs> took off like crazy. He's like a multi multi millionaire. And think about it. So you, I bought this product. It's called the lawnmower. It's, it shaves the thing. Hey, guess what? So now I'm not only going to buy the product and laugh, but I'm going to share it with the. <laughs> <laughs> with friends i'm not sure to shave but you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and and his company is manscaped right so yes manscaped um, exactly even that, like it's 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 you got manscaping it. manscaping yes um <laughs> so and kind if of you're manscaping that. you need a lot more <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well but right. just you know so so john gray was telling me when i first started this i got the idea because um, I'm very logical. In Montreal, I had an advertising agency. Even though when I moved to California, I developed a behavioral management firm, one of the nation's top behavioral management firms, which is really cool. Except it has, it's hard to say behavioral. It's like, you can't, I better say <laughs> okay. behavioral management. Anyway, we torture everybody. But um, I, um, so we we worked, I worked hard and I went, I won major clients like Kraft, Timex, Avon, Abbott Laboratories, Seagram's, their world headquarters is there, you know, but I'm a logical person and visual. So I like visuals. Okay. So we won lots of uh, major accounts because of that. And so we had an opportunity to win the, uh, the anti-drug campaign in America. And so I came up with a fantastic logical reasons why you shouldn't do drugs. Logic is the enemy of selling, by the way. I didn't even realize that. It's like, what? Start with logic, but then you've got to do a motion. Okay. Because they, they're, they're major, major, uh, uh, research projects that demonstrated that uh, one guy won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, uh, his name was Daniel Kahneman, a uh, Nobel Prize winning psychologist, that more than 90% of all decisions are made when you trigger the right side or the emotional side of the brain. It's not really right. We say right brain, left brain. It's not really because it mixes, you know, okay? But we call yeah. it right brain, which is emotional selling. And by the way, an easy way to remember right brain versus left brain is L is logic, lo left brain logic, okay? Right brain yes. is the other one. But um, so um, I came up with a fantastic logical reasons why you shouldn't do drugs. And then we saw the campaign that beat us and they deserved to beat us. It was a gazillion times better than we had ever done. And you know what it is. It's a guy holding an egg saying, this is your brain and then cracking the shell and dropping the egg into a sizzling frying pan. By the way, the sound sizzling frying the sizzling sound of the frying pan was very important to the triggering emotion, okay? They dropped yes. into the sizzling frying pan and said, this is your brain on drugs, any questions? And when I saw that, two things happened. The first one was, I knew it was a gazillion times better than anything I did. Second, it was, it was emotional selling. 
And I had no clue how to do emotional selling. And I realized, how can I be in advertising or marketing, you know, in life and not understand emotional selling? And they don't teach emotional selling at school, you know, and I went to the library to have like superficial books on, but they don't teach emotional selling. So I was like freaked out. So first I had sleepless nights thinking like, oh, how can I not know this? How can I not know this? But then the scientist in me said, you know what? I wonder if I could figure this out. Yes. So I got a box and I called it the passion box. And I said, every time I get something, I'm first I wrote on a three by five card, your brain on drugs. And I put it in the box. So I remember that. Okay. And then I, every time I came across something that I was passionate or saw something that was passionate, I'd either write a note about it or tear it out of a magazine or whatever, but I would put it in the box. Initially, I just put ads. But as time went on, I put things that were, um, you know, that were powerful statements that people said, and it, like uh, Dr. Seuss, you know, and it was it was it was so amazing. I actually put Dr. Seuss's book, when I, you know, the, <laughs> the cat in the hat in my box. <laughs> so I would remember this is a definition of how you, you know, yes, I, as I started doing it. And so eventually when I moved to California, John Gray was telling me how uh, his book, he wrote the best. If it's not the best, it's one of the best relationship books ever and he called it men women women and relationships and you know because i you know read the book but i talk about it but it was profound for me because he was telling me he said something and every all the girls in the audience laughed and all the guys in the audience looked at the girls and went like what are you laughing at you know <laughs> and he said well look you can see that some things women laugh at and men don't and some things men laugh at and women don't and there are a lot of things that we both laugh at and that's a good way to understand that we're totally different so one of the women said it's almost like men are from a different planet. What planet do you think men are from? And he paused and he started laughing and he said, I guess men are from Mars. And yeah. the whole audience laughed. Said, okay. I don't think we're from Mars, by the way. We might be, but I, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. But so uh, when he got home, he was thinking like, wow, I got everybody engaged. Okay. And that's what the, um, Brain Glue is about is how do you engage the listener or the reader, okay, in a, in a higher level than they would normally be engaged, okay? We hear words and read words, and that's fine. So he went, so if men are from Mars, where are women from? I guess women are from Venus. Venus is the god of love. And he got this crazy idea. What happens if I change the title of the book from men, women, and relationships to men are from Mars, women are from Venus? And I'll do references throughout the book. It'll be the same book, but I'll put references to men are from Mars, women are from Venus throughout the book so it doesn't feel like a strange. And what do you think happened? Almost overnight, just by changing the title, he, he sold half a million copies, then a million, then two million. You know how many copies he sold? 50 million. In the book, I say 10 million. And I had uh, Steve Harrison, who's like, who helped promote him. And he said, no, no, you're off. He sold 50 million books already. It's like, sorry. <laughs> you know. So he, he, when it, with the old title, it was 20,000. With the new yes. title, it went to 50 million. And I was Jeez. like, ah, oh, I was blowing my mind. It's like, wow, this is incredible. Just by changing the title, he suddenly had yeah. this. And it's because it triggers things in the brain. So when I got home, I was going to put it in my passion box. And I said, no, 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 hang on a second. This is too powerful. And I put it on my bed. I have to make my bed. I don't know if my bed was made, but I had to make my blanket, you know, my uh, bedspread because it was big. And I dumped all the stuff that I had at that point onto the bed in the, from the passion box. And I said, can I group them together? Yeah. I grouping them together and I started to recognize his as a, a metaphor or alliteration. And I started realizing, wow, like Shark Tank, you know, that's not a tank full of sharks, the TV show Shark Tank. I mean, it feels yeah. like it's on the show, but it's not. It's, you know, and yet if they called it the, um, the Investors Club or the Investors Group, you think it would be a successful? I don't think so. No. Rocky Road ice cream. I saw this thing on Discovery Channel talking about Rocky Road ice cream. It's not a, you know, when you open up, it's not a bunch of rocks inside it. You know? <laughs> it's, you know, dry. And, but yeah. Breyer's ice cream went from like a, a struggling to a, a monster of success. It was back in the days of the Great Depression. So what they did was um, back then they had uh, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry ice cream. Those are the main ones. So they said, why don't we mix it? So they took chocolate ice cream, they put nuts in it and marshmallows. And they wanted to come up with a name. They actually stole the name from somebody else, but that's a whole other story. But they said, we should call it Rocky Road. Rocky Road is really cool. And Rocky Road has three tools of brain glue that are really profound, okay? The first okay. one is a metaphor. Because it's not rocks. You open it up and you don't get rocks inside it. I mean, I don't think you do. Anyway, <laughs> I might break my tooth. So this, it's a metaphor. The second thing it uses is alliteration. R -r -r -r, Rocky Road. Alliteration is repetition of sounds. 
And then I started realizing, look at how many blockbuster products use uh, uh, alliteration. Uh, Coca-Cola, Best Buy, PayPal, TikTok. You think if TikTok called itself the Chinese uh, uh, social media platform, they'd have as many people yeah. using it? No. Yeah, video shorts. Yeah, video shorts, <laughs> exactly. So that's right. But they recognize the power of, a short, of the name TikTok because it has alliteration. They went, okay, that's interesting. Then they use humor. And humor is a powerful sales tool. You don't always have to use humor, but humor is a powerful sales tool. And what they said was, uh, Rocky Road was started during the Great Depression, and the nickname for the Great Depression was "We're all on, on a rocky road." So their concept was, "We're on a rock. We're all on a rocky road. We might as well eat rocky road ice cream." It's kind of funny, <laughs> you know, when you think about it. But just by using that phrase, it suddenly, you know, exploded. So I had this thing, because I want to relate this to the fact that this relates to all copy that we're doing, okay? And you're not going to fill it all with it, but you're going to have certain points where you're going to have brain glue tool at the beginning, so you grab their attention, you know, and throw up, maybe you'll, you'll have it. Like I said, um, brain glue shows you how to light the fire of desire in your buyer, <laughs> okay? So I went to chat GPT and said, could chat GPT come up with something? They came up. It was like stupid phrases. It was not very good. They came up with a good one, and I use it all the time now. And it's uh, why brain glue because because plain glue doesn't stick to the brain. <laughs> hey, so go chat GPT. Hey, yeah. <laughs> well, about yeah. This sometimes, but I just I wanted to tell you this one thing because how it relates beyond just copywriting. Okay, this okay. woman, this this mom says to me. So I have my fourteen year old son, and he asked me this question. I don't know how to answer it. Could you help me? Because you know brain glue. And I'm like, okay. You know, I was like, okay, sort of the curve at me. She said, my son says, um, you know, 14 years old, why do we have to follow so many rules in life? Okay. <laughs> so I said, let's yeah. use some brain glue tools. So the first one is what rhymes with rules? Fools. So, okay, only fools don't follow rules. There's one, but I want to make it even stronger. Okay. I'll, maybe I'll use a metaphor. And I came up with this metaphor. And so I sat down with him and his mom, and I said, so you were asking your mom, why do we have to follow so many rules in life, right? And he said, yeah. I said, so when you're thirsty, you could drink out of the toilet, but why would you want to? Remember, only fools don't follow rules. And then he <laughs> says, he says, hmm, that makes sense. Does it really make sense? Or did I just trigger parts of the brain? And there are two political statements. I'll go, you know, what's happened? But I, there are two political statements that, that go along with this. And one of them is, you can't hug a child with nuclear arms. Hmm, okay, they're saying hug a child, which is very emotional, with nuclear arms. Yeah. Putting those two together. There's another one. And I'm not going to get into you know, pro-gun or anti-gun. I'm not involved in that at all. Okay, But I was impressed by this comedian that came up with this line. And he said, the right to bear arms is almost as crazy as the right to arm bears. <laughs> okay, it's like, okay. People laugh and they go like that, but they go, okay, it kind of resonates. You know, they don't know why, but it does. But it's because brain glue tools, they stick to the brain. And it's like, you can't even help it. I mean, even the eagles stuck to the brain with, you know, Winslow, Arizona. They didn't even mean to. That's how powerful brain glue tools are. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that jumped out at me as we were talking about the Rocky Road thing is, um, is the reference that you made in the book to the Rolling Stone, uh, to the, the term Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how many different places just um, that little piece of brain glue was used over the course of about a decade, maybe? Yeah. No, more than um, that, because it goes back to, I think, like almost 100 years ago. Um, <laughs> but but there, there was there was there was a yes. run um, that you talked about. I think it's Start with muddy waters. Yeah, muddy waters, and then uh, the Rolling Stones. Uh, um, I forget what his name was, but the guy that actually left the Rolling Stones. He's the one that was sitting down, and they, uh, somebody said, "Well, what's the name of your group?" And he didn't know, and he had a muddy waters record on it that was, you know. Uh, and so he said, "Oh, Rolling Stones. Oh, great! It sounds like a great name." And suddenly he had Rolling Stones. Then yeah. Bob Dylan came out with a song, you know, and there was a. Uh, I forget what it is, but the Rolling Stone. Um, and then the Rolling Stone magazine came out with it. Gee, what a coincidence. You think it just came up with it out of the blue? <laughs> yeah. Um, and and so it's just it's just tapping into the tapping into the zeitgeist is is another one of those I did. I don't exactly um I, I, I don't remember what chapter that fit in, 
Um, I, I mean, in, in some way, it's kind of the odd and unexpected. Some way, it's kind of a, a trigger word. But um, with like like with the idea of of Rocky Road, it's just it's tapping into what people are already thinking about. So there's that that recognition, that head nodding effect that goes on. Now, one of the things that um, jumped out at me in the book was uh, a, a term that I have not. Um, it hadn't stuck yet, um, which is the chiasmus, right? Mm -hmm. um, those are really fascinating to me. And I think that they um, they are a great way for delivering meaning. So can you, can you uh, lay out what that is uh, just in terms of like a definition and then, uh, and then speak to some of the examples that you have for Absolutely. those? Absolutely. So rhyme is like A, B, A, B. You're sort of repeating it, okay? Chiasmus yeah. is A, B, B, A. It's like it flips it. I'm just throwing that at you, but I'll give you examples and people will relate to it because we've heard tons of chiasmus phrases throughout our life. We go like, whoa, that sticks. And we start share, sharing with people. Winners never quit and quitters never win. When the going gets tough, the tough Let's get going. going. Okay. <laughs> Uh, President John F. Kennedy used it. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And it sticks. And people remember it. I know people who are old enough to remember it. And they like, you know, I just start the phrase and they finish it because they remember it. OK, um, he said mankind must put an end to world world, put an end to mankind and all that stuff. May West, the comedian, used it. Well, May West, the comedian, used it. OK, it's not the men in your life that matters. It's the life in your men. <laughs> she has better ones. It's better to be it's better to be looked over than overlooked, which I thought was fun <laughs> for a woman. I could see her. You know, she wrote anyway. It's funny. She wrote uh, a play called Sex. And uh, they they there were things in it today. We totally accept it. But back then they wouldn't have accepted it. So they said, you know, we're going to we, we don't want to arrest you. She said, no, no, please arrest me. They said she said well, they said, why? Because I'll get more publicity. Please arrest me. So they arrested <laughs> her. She got all this publicity. Um, May West is awesome. She said, uh, women like a man with a past, but they prefer a man with a present. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, when women uh, when women go wrong, men go right after them. <laughs> good, good girls go to heaven. Bad girls go everywhere. <laughs> and my favorite, hopefully I'm not crossing a line with your audience here, is a hard man is good to find. <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah he was good man is hard to find a hard man is good to find yeah um yeah but yeah just uh, einstein said it. you can't fix yourself by breaking someone else i mean it's powerful when you hear it that way you know when you hear uh, lines like that it's really powerful and it's just you know so what we do is i'm a logical person okay when i wrote my book huh, i got jack hanfield loves my book okay i'm and he sold chicken soup for the soul he sold 500 million copies, 100 million copies of Chicken Soup for the Soul and 400 million copies of Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul, Chicken Soup for Cancer Survivor Soul and everything else. So the guy sold 500 million copies. I don't know, in a buck a book, that's not bad. Uh, it's a little more than I make. So but um, uh, so I don't need to teach him anything. He's already an expert, right? He's already sold other 65 other books and all that stuff that are bestsellers. Most of them are bestsellers because even though they're fabulous books, but because he's famous. It's yes. easy when you're famous to suddenly saw a buck, okay? So, but he said, he got pissed off at me. He said, you know, I started reading your book. I couldn't put the damn thing down. I got so many <laughs> other things to read. It's like, sorry, you know, can I include that as a quote, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he said, I'm forcing everybody in my company to read my book. You know, read your books. So it's really great. But he said, but my book was originally called, this is <laughs> the, the punishment of being a left brain person, okay? My book was originally called, because I wanted to make it clear what it is. Sell more with a right brain marketing strategy. And Jack Canfield said, you got to change the title. I said, what? He said, yeah, it's, it's, your whole book is about brain glue. Why are you calling it? You're, you're, you're teaching us to be right brain and you got a left brain title. You can't do that. You have to change it. And you know, when you publish a book on Amazon, you want to get like a ton of reviews because once you get so many reviews, it goes into their algorithm. So I'm like, I have to go back to zero? He said, yes, I don't care what it is. You're a brain glue guy. You need to go back. to That title needs to change the brain glue. You want my quote? You need to change the title of brain glue. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, exactly. But it's just, it's, we fall into the trap of, you have to start by thinking of logically, okay? Think of logically, what do we want to say? 
And then you start applying brain glue tools and it, you go like, wow. And you start to realize how much more powerful it is. But you have to start with logic. Well, so oh, let me give you a, sorry, I got an example just to talk about this. Okay. okay, sorry. I got another example. So Got Milk, what a fabulous campaign it was. Most people yeah. don't realize Got Milk sucked as a marketing campaign. Here's an article in Business Week from about 10 years ago, and it's called Got, uh, Got Milked. After $385 million, <laughs> sales still continue to decline. And so I have, as a ton of people have, you know, I have a gut milk book and a milk mustache book. One of my daughters has a milk mustache uh, with, I forget who it is, but a famous person with a milk mustache. So they love milk, uh, the milk gut milk campaign, but they don't buy milk because the reason people don't buy milk is it used to be people, everybody would buy milk because it has calcium in it. Well, yeah. you can get calcium from spinach. Most people didn't realize that. You can get calcium pills and all that stuff. The second thing is... Um, um, a lot of people have lactose intolerance or believe they have lactose intolerance, which is you drink milk and you sort of makes you feel weird. Okay. And so if you have lactose intolerance and I say, got milk, you might love the campaign, but you're not going to buy milk. And so you have yeah. to remember, you know, it's got to tie together with why people should buy your product. And if you well, yeah. do that, then it takes you, off. You get the, you get the emotional hook, you get the, the attention, but then it has to be translated into the logical justification. Um, and so it's always it's always about that mixing emotion and uh, and and logic and relevance. Uh, yeah, one of the things. So it's really funny that Jack Canfield is the one that pushed you to do the brain brain glue because <laughs> brain glue is a type of brain glue, which is an allergy, right? And chicken soup for the soul is an allergy, and. So just the recognition there that, okay, in my title, or we could replace- By the way, so, so just so because we're talking about that, I want to relate to this, okay? okay? He was telling me in his book, he was trying to come up with a name for it, and, he, and it was 101 motivational stories, okay? And so yeah. he, said, he woke up one morning and he said, chicken soup makes you feel good. My book makes you feel good. I should call it chicken soup. He was going to call it chicken soup for the spirit. This is how alliteration works, Okay. Yeah, he says the chicken soup for the spirit doesn't work. It was bothering him for like quite a while. He was calling it chicken soup for the spirit. And he said S O U P S O U L. Chicken soup for the soul resonates with the brain much better than chicken soup for the spirit. And so he applied that. Now he was telling me I didn't know I was using brain glue. So none of my yeah. other books use that stuff. All of my books are how to do this, how to do that, and everything else. And I'm realizing now I wish I had it earlier because I started applying it. But for even for him. He recognized that chicken soup for the spirit was close, but it wasn't exactly there. And when he created, a, he used alliteration, it just, it became uh, powerful. And there are a lot of things that we have. I, I have famous people use alliteration. Uh, Chevy Chase, Marilyn Monroe. I got a great Marilyn Monroe story, by the way. Uh, Marilyn Manson, Jesse Jackson, uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, Barack Obama. You think there's not alliteration in that? Barack Obama, the sound yeah. resonates, Okay. You have Cape Cod, baby boomers, bed bugs, cash cow, you know, phrases, cool as a cucumber, you know, really how cool is the cucumber, <laughs> you know, cream of the crop, dead as a doornail, how dead is a doornail, but they, they resonate, you know, and when you use a phrase like that, you know, it, it just, it resonates. Doesn't yeah, it? absolutely. Absolutely. So let me, let me actually, uh, let me take you away from your notes for a minute here okay mm -hmm. um because my great grandmother's cousin was harry truman the president uh -huh. um he actually lived with them for a little bit uh, when he was young and he's well known for pithy phrases catchy yep. phrases yep. um and so so I, I grabbed I grabbed a couple of quick quotes and i'll I'll let you maybe even just pick one whichever one just jumps out and i would Love to um, have you reflect maybe on the the brain glue that you see in these quotes. So I have four. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Yeah, that's the bad buck one. stops here. Always be sincere, even if you don't mean it. And it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. Yeah, it's you fabulous. Know? And people don't realize that if it's amazing, you know that one uses chiasmus because it's a flip. Okay. The first one you said, what was the first one again? That uses a chiasmus if you, also. It's, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. That also uses something I call um, um, sensory elevation. Okay, that's like, uh, 
Um, Kurt Cobain's song smells like teen spirit. Yeah, what does teen spirit smell like? Is that like a locker room? But he's using that plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. A lot of people don't know this, but Alka-Seltzer, the reason they came up with that was because um, Alka and it, it turned Alka-Seltzer into a blockbuster product back then. But the reason they came up with it was the scientists discovered that one Alka-Seltzer wasn't enough to make you feel better. You actually have to have two. So they said, okay, so why don't we come up with this phrase, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. And then it's, it uses rhyme. It uses sens sensory elevation because it's, it's the fizz fizz. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and on a subconscious level, it's telling you to, right? It's, you're not going to plot fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. It's plot, plot, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. And so the exactly. understanding is that you're going to use two. And you're going to get relief. Exactly. And so yes. I have this guy. So. If you do, if you throw too much logic in a person, I mean, we know we want people to like, know, like, and trust us, okay? And that's emotion. So if they if they trust you, they may buy from you even if they don't totally, aren't totally sold on a product. Got that? But you can't depend on that. And so, um, when you're talking about um, uh, emotional triggers, if you throw too much logic at a person, it actually turns off the emotion side of the brain, which makes it harder to sell. So I'm sitting, I'm working with this finance company, and I was teaching her people like how to sell. Uh, more effectively, you, because numbers people, finance people are numbers people. They're going to throw numbers at y'all. You're going to make 12% interest. You're going to all that stuff. Well, that turns off a lot of people's brains. They don't. I try to explain to them, have, do you know how, how many people hated math in school? And you're throwing math at them? I mean, come yeah. on. And so I don't want to say who this person was, but this person is a famous musician. And one of their people was talking to this person who was a famous musician and telling him how, you know, you, I think you can make as much as 12% on this thing sometimes as the uh, rates go up and down on this thing, it would really be valuable. And I could see the guy's eyes glazing over. And so I went up to him because I know the product, I was helping him do it. And I said, well, just so you understand, John Lennon used a very similar, uh, as a very similar technique to this. And it's why he was able to, his estate was able to retain its value and not get eaten away by all the taxes. And the guy says, oh, John Lennon used it. Oh yeah, I definitely, huh, sign me up, okay. <laughs> Did he care about the numbers? Yeah, I mean, that's why a lot of famous people have uh, finance people that screw, you know, uh, um, that screw them out of their money because they never look at their money. You know, it's Billy Joel is one of them. But um, yeah. so I want to I want to give you another tool that's that, okay. that's really powerful. So there's reintegration, which is I'm not talking about reintegration. But I want to use this as a starting point. Okay, reintegration is the brain's need for completion, not reintegration, but reintegration. Okay, it's the brain's need for completion. It's why we watch crappy movies to the end. My wife is sitting and watching a TV show, and I said, "Hey, is this any good?" She said, "Not stupid." Well, why are you watching it? Well, I want to see how it turns out. Okay, I got it. Okay, got a brain work. Yeah. So, what's the most powerful tool of human interaction that exists? I'm using it now, aren't I? What am I doing? I'm asking questions, aren't I? Okay, yes. questions are really powerful. And hopefully I'll remember this really powerful question that really got me focusing on this area. So that's reintegration is the brain's need for completion. But there's also asymmetry, which is we like symmetry because of reintegration. We like symmetry, okay? So you can throw a curve so it isn't symmetrical. It att attracts attention. And so I'll give you an example. Oh, well, there's a joke. Uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, congratulations. Okay, you expected fool me twice, shame on me, but I give you a twist. Okay, Marilyn Monroe. Okay, Norma Jean, and uh, her manager. I think it was her manager that came up with the name Marilyn. You should call yourself Marilyn. And her, her, I think it's her stepfather named Monroe, so she came up with Marilyn Monroe. By accident, she came up with alliteration, repetition of some M -m -m Marilyn Monroe. Okay, yeah. She loved Jean Harlow, who was a famous actress in the early days. Okay. She loved Jean Harlow. And Jean Harlow had platinum blonde hair. So what Marilyn did was she went to the same hairdresser that Jean Harlow used and got her hair color the same color as, as uh, Jean Harlow's. So she was a platinum blonde, okay? Now, Marilyn has a beauty mark on her left cheek. So she covered it up with makeup. But one day she's looking at photographs of Jean Harlow and she realizes some of the photographs have, her, have Jean Harlow with a beauty mark on her cheek and sometimes it's on her chin. And she went, wait a second. I bet she doesn't even have a beauty mark. She's putting a dot on her face and it attracts attention to her. So from that point forward, Marilyn Monroe would, would not hide, but would darken the beauty mark so people could see her beauty mark. Okay. Um, if you ever watch Gilligan's Island, Ginger has a beauty mark in the middle of her cheek. 
you know? And so Marilyn attributes part of her success to her beauty mark. So um, um, what's her name, the supermodel? Um, 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 uh, it's... Uh, it's it's it's, it's not coming to me, nuts. but I think that I know. Yeah. Uh, so Cindy Crawford. Yeah, there we go. Cindy Crawford has a beauty mark, a birthmark over her her left lip. Okay. Yeah. When she was a kid, she begged her mom to take her to the doctor and get it removed, and her mom didn't. And right now, she says she is so happy that her mom didn't get it removed because she believes that that beauty mark is a big part of how she became a supermodel. Really? And so yeah, widely of, recognized. Yeah, exactly. You can see she's, everybody else looks nice and neat and everything else. She's got this beauty mark, you know, like Marilyn has a thought. So what made me think of it was David Ogilvy, a famous advertiser, you know, back in the early days. And David Ogilvy was doing an ad for um, Hathaway shirts. And so how do you do an ad for a, a, a photo of a Hathaway shirts ad? Okay. You have a guy standing in a good background with a nice looking shirt, a good looking guy with a nice shirt and uh, nice pants. Okay. And yes. every, every shirt ad looks the same. So what he did was he put an eye patch on the guy. The guy wasn't a pirate, but by putting the eye patch on the guy, people go, oh, there's a guy with an eye patch. What's that all about? Oh, I have some white shirts. Okay. And it draw, drew you in to and the, the, the The headline was, and and without the eye patch, this might not this might not be as compelling of this wouldn't be nearly as compelling of a headline, but the headline was just the man in the Hathaway shirt. Right. And yep. so it's like, who is this man in the Hathaway shirt? And with the eye why patch. do I need to know about him? Yes. Uh -huh. Like with the eye patch. Right. Um, and so so it sparked curiosity with something uh, odd and unexpected. Right. Right. And and pulled you in. Well, that's, that's why. So I saw this. I don't know if I said this before, but if I repeated myself, it's because I'm old. So give me a break. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, I saw the ad for uh, Pampers Diapers, and it said, to pee or not to pee, we have the answer, okay? So they're picking something that we know and twisting it. You know, it's like the eye patch. It's like, wait a second, I thought I knew this. <laughs> what, to pee or not to pee? You know, and it really, so uh, uh, Jurex Condoms has this fantastic ad, and it says, um, Luke, I am not your father, okay? <laughs> <laughs> And when it grabs your attention, because it basically everybody, you know, everybody who knows Star Wars, so it's Luke, I am your father. You know, that yes. was like a big thing. But Luke, I am not your father. Jorex condoms. Oh, I get it. Okay. The condom works. So blah, blah, yeah. But it's just when you see these things connect together, first it's fun and people are going to laugh. By the way, if you can get them to laugh, they're more, you know, laughers are buyers often, not always. Okay. If, if yes. you're selling funeral products, I'm not sure that's the best thing. But anyway, you know, maybe. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, but just again, it's engaging the brain. It's triggering parts of the brain, so people go like, "Oh, hey, yeah, oh, oh, that's interesting." It's like when I when I saw first saw Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I was in this bookstore and I saw, okay, books, okay, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Oh, what's that? And I picked <laughs> it up. When you pick it up, that's the first step to buying it, right? You got to pick it up before you put it in your hand before you buy it. Usually, unless it's online. And so, so it, it does that. I have to share a story with you because this is a line, this is a famous line from advertising that you reference in your book. Um, it, immediately recognizable as a very sensory, um, a, a sensory cue from advertising. It actually has ties into our little world of direct response. So one of the copywriters who I consider to be a hero, his name is Gary Bensavenga. And um, Gary, Gary had tremendous success as a direct response, direct mail copywriter. Um, he still has an olive oil business right now. But when he was growing up, his dad was, I believe, a public servant, like was not a copywriter, was not in advertising, anything like that. But there was a contest for this breakfast cereal. This breakfast cereal was called Rice Krispies or crisp rice or something. I think they might have been in, in the middle of the, the rebrand uh, into Rice Krispies. And they said, um, write us a letter about why you love Rice Krispies. And the winning letter will receive some prize, right? And Gary Bensavinga's dad wrote this letter to about Rice Krispies. And he said, um, I love Rice Krispies because it is the cereal with that snap crackle 
and pop. Right. And that became Snap, Crackle, Pop, Rice Krispies. It became the characters Snap, Crackle, and Pop. And it is it is such a sensory cue for the experience of what happens when you pour my uh, pour, pour mice in Rice Krispies. No, that's that's a whole different thing. Um, yeah, right. Pour milk <laughs> in Rice Krispies. Right. And um and, and you hear the cereal go Snap, Crackle, and Pop. Um, a fascinating so, little so, bit of advertising history. So related to that, okay? Yeah. Post hated Kellogg's, okay? Even okay. though they stole cereal from Kellogg's and they started and started, but that's how they started their business. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. And so I forget who it was, but the president of Post wanted to come up with a totally new type of breakfast cereal. So they figured out this thing that we can, you know, we can create a little kind of, a, you know, a thing with a jelly inside it and uh, like a little cake and we can put it in a toaster. And so they were really excited about the fact that we're launching this new type of breakfast cereal. You put in a toaster and suddenly you have this little cake, okay? And they called it Country Squares. And so Kellogg's, I forget his name, but the, the CEO of Kellogg's went like, oh, okay. And they announced it like about four months before they actually launched the product, okay? So he had four months to come up with a better product. So they came up with uh, this fantastic product. They figured out how to do it and they came up with it really fast. And uh, they decided... They're going to come up with a better name. So you think of a name. What's a good name? Or back then they had, uh, um, what's his name? The pop artist. Uh, everybody knows him. Uh, oh, uh, Warhol. Is that oh, yeah, Andy Warhol? So Andy Warhol was really popular back then, and they called it pop art, right? So he yeah. said. Uh, so he said, "Why don't we call it pop tarts?" Okay, <laughs> pop tarts. Yes. So think of it in two ways. One is it was a popular phrase, pop art. They're talking about pop art, how cool it was, Andy Warhol, all that stuff. The Rolling Stones had the guy with the, the tongue and it sort of came out of that whole area era of pop tarts, a pop art. And so he called it pop tarts, which made everybody remember it, but also pop. It pops out of the toaster. Sound it pops out of the toaster. Okay. Yes. He didn't mean it that way, but that's how he came out. Pop tarts was so successful that Post, who was invented the product, decided to drop the product. They tried to sell it, and nobody wanted to buy it because everyone was buying Pop-Tarts instead, okay? Because of the <laughs> name. Because the name resonated with the brain of Pop-Tarts. You got to get Pop-Tarts. Oh, wow, cool. So Pop-Tarts, Country Squares, which one are you going to buy? Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I think I think at this point, like, um, I, I want to reflect that if you are – listening to this and you're enjoying listening to this and maybe you're getting ideas or recognizing how just going through all this stuff can stimulate your creative imagination for coming up with these things for yourself. Like that's, that's what happens when you go through brain glue too. They, I, I mean, it's full of examples like this, full of saying, okay, here's what you need to do. And here's a million examples. And here's why that's so powerful. And, um, as you're going through, whether you're trying to write a headline that's going to cap capture attention, like Volkswagen, think small, right? Um, or, or what was what was the other Volkswagen? There was um, it stays ugly longer, or, yeah. or something, it was something yeah. like that. It was like um, what? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it sticks to the brain. It's like it smells like Teen Spirit. You know? Yeah, what a great <laughs> song that is, by the way. But it's even greater because of that title. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so if you want to be coming up with sticky ideas, I, you know, I strongly recommend the book Brain Glow. Um, it's 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 an easy read, or in my case, listen. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it was quick. I was I was uh, you know doing doing housework and and just coming up with ideas, ideas, ideas. I have a, a notes document that's on my on my phone and accessible everywhere that you know internet is available. And I was just coming up with notes and it, it can be just a powerful tool for that. So we'll include a link in the description uh, to Brain Glue, whether you're listening or watching this on YouTube or whatever, uh, to, to buy Brain Glue on Amazon. There's also additional resources available. There's a free gift that you get, um, uh, you know, once you get to the back of the book uh, as, as a creative idea stimulation tool. Is there anything else that people should know about the book, James, before um, before we send them off to grab it. Well, I, I, so, and I believe a lot of people need to do this, but so if you do brain it'll take you to the Amazon page. 
Okay. Um, and uh, and then you can, you know, Amazon lets you read part of the books, which is really cool. But it was also, it lets you listen to a uh, sample from the, uh, and it gives a sample of, you know, the sample of that city in Canada that came up with a really cool slogan. <laughs> okay. And they laugh and they apologize after. Sorry. I'll give you something that nobody don't, a lot of people don't know. It's not in the book. So what's the company? A company came up with a slogan and they, they apologize because they offended people for it. Okay. In Amer North America, because they said people in North America don't have a sense of humor like the rest of Europe and all that. And it's screw yourself. Who do you think the company is? And it's when you hear who it is, it's perfect, perfect, perfect. Screw yourself. How's that for a, a slogan? Okay. It certainly catches your attention. Ikea. When you buy wow. from, anything you buy from Ikea, you got to screw the thing in yourself. It comes with screws, <laughs> you know, and it's screw yourself. So screw yourself actually applies to Ikea, but people are offended sure. in North America, so they, but they still have it in other parts of the world. But it's just, it's a powerful, <laughs> it's, re it's relevant. Yeah, yeah. I think that sometimes I wonder if, if in today's culture, even if, um, I don't know, 10 years ago, that would not have flown in today's culture, it seems like anything flies. Um, so well, maybe sadly, that's like sadly you have people like Jerry Seinfeld and Chris Rock that can't even do colleges anymore because people will be offended. It's like get over it, you know. I mean, really, because humor is good for a lot of reasons. One is it helps sell products. Let's start there, okay? We're marketing, but it also it cures illnesses. You know, laughter is the best medicine is true because it triggers oxytocin in the, in, the, in the bloodstream from the brain that actually helps heal people. And so that's part of why when you're if you if you don't have to have humor. OK, there are lots of other brain tools. But if you can include humor, it's like the guy with the, you know, with the lawnmower. You know, I mean, oh. suddenly your business can take off like gangbusters. And that's what we're talking about is right. You know, I. Can I, can I give you a quick example or are we almost out of time? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. So I had a construction. So when I first started to recognize how powerful brain glue was at a construction company, I didn't, but I had a construction company as a client. There were three guys who after 10 years had 2 million in sales. Not bad. 2 million in sales after, you know, 10 years. In one year, I took them to 10 million. They went from 2 to 10 million. And two years later, it went to 32 million. By the way, when I took them to 10 million, they said, hey, the goal was supposed to be 12 million. I said, shut <laughs> up. They bought each other the biggest BMW as presents. You know what I mean? They were like, they couldn't believe how much money was coming and just because of this change. So what was the change I did? You have a whiteboard behind you, right? I love whiteboards. Yeah. So pull out a whiteboard. These guys are funny because they said, we don't use a whiteboard. So after you're done, you can take the whiteboard with you. After one or two weeks, they said, do not take that whiteboard. We need that. Okay. <laughs> so it was great. But I said, Let's make a shopping list of all the different types of clients you go after. Okay. Da, 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 all these different, everybody. Just, it took a while to come up with everything. Okay, fine. I said, so I'm going to play a game with you. You need to pick one type of client that you're going to go after. And not nobody else, just one. They said, well, no, we don't do that because we don't want, to, don't want to turn away business. I said, I got that. But we're going to, let's play this game. We're going to focus on just one. It took a while. And then they came up with buyer restoration for insurance companies. I didn't know what that was, so I had to explain it. But it's like every time an insurance company has a client that has a fire, you know, if the, they have to check the frame first. If the frame is damaged, you got to tear down the whole building. If it's not damaged, you have to, you know, set it up so the building is not going to catch fire again and all that stuff. And so he said, yeah, we'd like to actually focus on fire restoration for insurance companies. So now I go to Brain Glue and I said, well, we need a tool. The first thing they think of with fire restoration is fire. So yeah. let's come up with, let's call you guys the fire extinguisher for insurance companies. And we'll actually come up with FireX, okay? Because, by the way, with the, with the URL, you have to do F-I-R-E-X and F-I-R-E-E-X, you know, because people will spell yes. it. Yes. Okay, and it's only a few bucks more. But anyway, let's call it, you. when you're talking to clients, tell them, hey, we're the fire, we're your fire extinguisher. So every time you have a client that has a fire, call us, we're your fire extinguisher. And yeah. that took them, and they, first it was fun. It added fun to their pitch. But second is it took them from two to 10 million in sales in one year. And then 32 million two years later, just because of this focus, because they made it, they had a, a, they picked a narrow niche, but they found an easy way to describe the niche. And so that's why, you know, Brinko were like, I have so many examples of trying with clients, including many of them that say, do not share this. We do not want our competitors to know what we're doing. <laughs> Jeez, uh, at the risk of this conversation going on forever, there's the category design folks, which 
the the book is is I feel like really poorly titled. The book is Think Bigger, um, but it's all about this approach to category design. And I would say that brain glue is a really powerful way to create that category of one, right? To to say like, yeah, fire uh, the fire extinguishers being a construction company that created a category of one for them that made it really easy for them to dominate and then expand, right? Um, that's 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 so excellent, so excellent. Okay, so the URL is brain glue book. Dot com. Uh, we will include a link in the description for folks to pick up the book on Amazon. James, and remember, it's James I. Bond. If you're going to type it into Google, <laughs> um, <laughs> James I. Bond, I thank you so much for being on Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Roy, thank you for having me. It was lots of fun. I'm having a great time with you. So, <laughs> Absolutely. And it's everyone, it's everyone who uh, has listened through this or watched through this. Thank you as well. Let me know, like, how are you going to use this uh, going forward in your marketing in your business? Uh, with that, I'm Roy Furthest, Breakthrough Marketing Secrets, and I'll catch you again in the next episode. See you soon. Thank you once again for tuning in to this daily episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Remember, check out the links with this episode for even more value. Now make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and engage in every way you can to keep this show going and growing and delivering daily value to you. I'll catch you soon for your next big breakthrough.